Today, we talk about different models of reflective practice. Hello and welcome to Teacher Learning Cast, episode number 23, this day, September 29th, 2018. My name is Benjamin Stewart, calling from beautiful Aguascalientes. Good morning, everybody. This is Piri Herrera, also here in Aguascalientes, hoping you had a nice week and you are getting ready for the weekend. Today, uh, we get together again to talk, share, and uh, put on the table certain topics and see what we can do or what we can say about it and in order to reflect and learn a little bit more. Benjamin, good morning. Good morning, Piri. Always uh, happy to have this time each week to I uh, talk about different educational topics. You know, I we talk a lot throughout the week as we work in a, a BA program in English language teaching at the Universidad Autónoma de Aguascalientes. And so we have a lot of opportunities to throw around ideas. Um, this week, the topic was something that I came across uh, reading a, a book that I wanted to share with you regarding reflective practice. But before we get into that topic, I want to talk and really invite everyone who's watching this broadcast. I know we have a lot of followers on Facebook. We, in fact, have a Facebook page called Teacher Learning Cast. So we really encourage everyone to reach out, give us feedback, let us know what your thoughts are on any of the topics that we talk about. We're always looking for teachers to come and actually join our broadcast. In fact, this week, as I've done in the past couple of weeks, I've started to include our live link to our live broadcast. So if you want to come in and actually pop in and and say a few things or discuss what whatever we're talking about that particular day, we encourage you to do that. This week in particular, I also shared in a couple of other communities in Facebook, other uh, Facebook pages that are uh, for teacher English teachers here in Mexico, since we teach in Mexico. Um, so I'm trying to, we are trying to broaden our approach and uh, try to reach as many people as possible. And again, we have a Facebook page and we uh, have set it up for those who are interested in the topics that we're talking about. But I think the main thing, the main takeaway of what we're doing is to really encourage any teacher, whether you're teaching English or just general education, to find those communities that resonate with you so that you are part of the conversation, you're part of the, uh, uh, the solution, as it were. Um, but we really encourage you to reach out and uh, get involved in your own personal development. Right, we're trying to create this network, this interpersonal connection with uh, everybody else with the idea of enriching ourselves. So it's uh, in, in that sense, right? Because we want to uh, bring some better practices to our classroom and see what it's in trend, what uh, comments, what ideas, what other paths can we take in our classes. And obviously we are willing also to share with you whatever you want to hear, whatever question you have. If, uh, I mean, uh, whatever we say in here, it's mainly our opinion and our thoughts about it. But uh, whatever you want to ask, it's going to encourage us to look for more information and to be ready for you all, guys. Absolutely. So uh, feel free to reach out and uh, leave us feedback. Again, we're on Facebook, Teacher Learning Cast. We have a dedicated public page there that you can join and uh, find all of the past recordings that we have made. Uh, it's hard to believe. Uh, We've already got 22 broadcast pity. We started uh, in February of this year. Right. And so we've really accumulated over, I would say, 23 to 24 hours of content, uh, all specifically related to different aspects of education regarding teaching, learning, a lot of different uh, topics we've talked about in the past. So uh, again, check out our, our Facebook page because I think that's the best place to really find that content uh, that uh, perhaps you've missed if you are just joining us for the first time. So, um, yeah, I think we'll just go ahead and dive right in, uh, Pidi, and I'm going to start by sharing my screen so that you can see here what, what, here what I'm looking at. Uh, today's discussion really was motivated by a book that I started reading this week and be called Becoming a Reflective Teacher, and this kind of relates a lot to some prior conversations, Petey, that we've had. Uh, you talked a lot about flow in prior episodes of Teacher Learning Cast. I know you also presented at a conference on the, to on the topic, um, and really related to this author, Miali Sigzint Miali, I think is, uh, if I'm pronouncing the word right, uh, her name. 
Um, but I think that it's worth throwing out a couple of other ideas. Uh, this book, in fact, mentions uh, this author and mentions flow, but it also contrasts with other different models of reflective teaching. So today, that's kind of one of what I wanted to talk about. Wanted to take a couple of excerpts out of the book and and have some of your thoughts, Speedy, because I know you work a lot with teaching practicum. And I know that we talk a lot about reflective teaching in general in our own practice. So I, I kind of wanted to throw out some different ideas, different models that have been researched in the past to get some of your insight, as well as those who are, are watching our uh, broadcast. Uh, feel free to share your experiences with reflective teaching and any of the, the topics here that we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot because that's my... That's my approach. I always like getting uh, different views and then taking a little bit from this and a little bit from there. Just to give you a hint, in, in my master's degree thesis, I wrote about autonomous learning, but I mix it up with uh, learning community. So how about that? <laughs> yeah, so this is going to be right up your alley and uh, hopefully right up the alleys of others as well. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and start thinking uh, – discussing here about the first excerpt that I came across. Uh, and uh, I'm going to quote from the book here. Again, all the quotes are coming from this book, Becoming a Reflective Teacher by Robert Marzano. So this first quote says, Deliberate practice differs from the prior view of practice, that is, working uh, with a uh, autonomic, autonomic uh, behavior, because individuals engaged in deliberate practice tend to re resist automaticity. And so this kind of contrasts slightly with this idea of flow in that really the, uh, the objective of, of uh, really practice is, to, is for things to become automatic, that skills and knowledge just kind of come together in this idea of flow. And this contrasting view actually says the opposite, that it's really about adapting to new situations and it's it, you never really reach this level of automaticity, but that you are really learning more to adapt to different contexts and you're learning to weave in and out of these new experiences. And, and so this is the first, really the first notion, the first idea I wanted to throw out here with you, uh, Petey, is you know, what are your thoughts about this idea of flow for, that really seeks automaticity versus a deliberate practice that really says, well, we don't really ever become, nothing becomes automatic, that it's just we become better at adapting to new situations. Yeah, in fact, if we go for the idea of automaticity, then the flow stops, <laughs> right? Because <clears throat> pretty much when you get something master or something like automatic and there is no change in, in, in any sense, um, then that's exactly pretty much the idea that you get stuck a little bit and there is no moving forward through the flow in the sense, in, in the idea of, uh, uh, of the flow. But yes, I totally agree. Uh, you're, there's always something to embedder. There's always something to uh, transform. There's always something to adapt. And we need to keep on forward uh, looking for ways and paths to, um, to cope with this uh, impromptu changes that m may need to be done when you're in front of a classroom. It's interesting because I think we can all can relate to classes where things are going really well and we feel that there is a sense of flow, right? That things are just going well and the, <clears throat> the students are engaged, activities are flowing one to the next, uh, they're asking questions and you just feel like there is a sense of flow. So I, I find it, I'm kind of like thinking back and forth, like, yeah, there is this idea of flow that, yeah, we do want to reach this idea that, yeah, things are just moving along. But this idea of deliberate practice really says that, you know, it's not so much about that idea of flow. It's really looking for those new, new, uh, you know, those new experiences, those those cases where maybe we're not comfortable, and we've talked a little bit about this in the past, where are we really willing to, ch to accept challenges that are with maybe not, maybe that extend beyond our, our comfort zone, 
And are we willing to take some of those risks? So even though we don't feel at the moment that there is this quote unquote flow. Yeah. Well, well, the first thing in there is that uh, being aesthetic, it's going to be a problem in that sense because um, too much of the same thing, no matter how good it is, is not that good. Right. Uh, in fact, during this week, I was talking to some students that were teaching in, in, in our course in, in teaching worship, which is their, their second semester uh, simulating classes amongst themselves. And uh, precisely, I had a couple of students who are doing a fine job. They are doing something um, a little bit uh, kind of traditional, but with a, a little touch of, uh, of uh, fluency and, dynami and dynamism in the class. Uh, and, and it looks fine and everything goes okay, but then this was exactly part of the discussion. What's going to happen when you come with these kind of classes every single day to the same students? And then, uh, and it all started because another student mentioned, you make me feel like I was in high school uh, with the best of intention in the comments, right? But uh, when we started to reflect about the situation, uh, it ended up not being that good, uh, that, that idea of you made me feel like in high school, right? Because then at the end, we had this static moment in, in the teacher, which, in which we are looking at pretty much um, uh, very familiar standard procedures, which at the end tend to, uh, in, in this case, we talked about getting a very regular class, which tends to be boring. Yeah, and and I'm I'm thinking about my own context too about this idea of we may feel that we're in flow that things are going really well and even look and visually as we observe our students feel that things are going well but uh, I think we could also accept the fact that it we can be misled and we can think that things are going well when actually the students either aren't that happy about the class, they don't right. feel that they're like, like they're learning. One of the things that I started this semester in my prope group, I'm, I'm teaching a writing course for uh, first semester students who are about a, at an A2 uh, English proficiency level. And one of the things I started to do this, uh, this semester was to ask them to maintain a weekly journal. So every week they share with me a paragraph describing and reflecting on what they learned for that week, what was difficult for them this week, what they liked, what they disliked. And besides the fact of them, you know, practicing the writing skill, right? It also helps me as the instructor to to gain insight about how I think things are going, right? So I don't just rely on my own perception of the class, but I'm actually reaching out to my students and getting that information firsthand. Now that's not always easy to do because you know, if you ask them to be honest, most of the time they are going to be honest. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have to be in a, a frame of mind that says, okay, I'm willing to accept these comments, positive or negative, so that, you know, with the intention of then, you know, changing your, your practice as necessary, right, to try to accommodate for as many students as possible. So, I mean, that's a practical trip uh, uh, tip that, that I'm sh that's been in the literature and it's nothing new, but I think it's very effective. And any way that you can reach out to your students to really find how they perceive the class, I think that will definitely help inform you as the instructor to see, okay, is are we in this quote unquote flow? Are we going along well? And e even if you feel that you're trying something new and you think it's a, a disaster, you know, it could be that they even appreciate something different, something new in their class. And, you know, that it could work the other way and that you might actually get information from the students that say they are enjoying the class. They feel like they're learning, you know, even though you, the instructor, feel otherwise. Yeah. And, and you mentioned something very important in here, the change of practice. I think uh, you have to be very careful. I mean, every, every teacher has to be very careful when you go through this kind of reflection with the students because uh, as, as the old saying says, be careful what you wish, right? Because maybe all this feedback is giving you an impromptu that there needs to be a change in whatever you are believing in that moment or whatever you are doing, actually doing in that moment. And, uh, and, and it may be frustrating as a backwash effect if, uh, if the students don't see a change after you, they were asked 
about how things are going and they mention constantly things that they hope that can be changed and teachers they don't change that and that's frustrating for students and that can create a very um uh, a stressful environment in the sense that uh yes it happened before and we could cope with it but now that you mention it this is what it's happening and nothing is done about it right somebody said the other day uh, is there is there anywhere i can complain uh, about someone and i was well you have to go to this kind of person uh okay and if i did who do i complain about this kind of person i mean who do i go to complain about this other kind of person because nothing is done about it so so i think what you mentioned there is that you have to be you have to be prepared in mind and, and in will to do this change of practice if necessary. And also make sure that you're guiding students so that they are providing constructive criticism, right? So it might depend on the maturity of the level and you know their, their perspective and their history and their backgrounds, but you need to make sure that you're giving them leading questions and examples of the types of reflections that you like so it just doesn't turn into a yeah a complaining right, you right. know uh, just a complaining session um, but that they are constructive in saying okay if you don't like a particular class what would you you know what what kind of class would you like but i think that yeah you're never you're never going to please everybody all the time so it, i think that again um, you know it can be uh, something new and maybe a challenge to accept that type of feedback, but I, I still think that the alternative of not receiving it puts you in a, in a worse uh, position, right? So um, I think it's just a matter of kind of seeing what, for each teacher the best way to reach out to those students and try to get that direct feedback because it doesn't have to be necessarily every week, it doesn't have to be necessarily a written text, um, but that in some way you're reaching out and getting that uh, information. Man, may, I may be jumping a little bit ahead. I don't know if you're going to talk about this later, but uh, I kind of uh, uh, read that this deliberate practice focuses on the minimals, on the specifics, right? Is it like that? Is it what you read? Um, yeah, yeah, it is. In fact, let me let me go through because the this idea of deliberate practice kind of leads into some other aspects, but I, I that I think are kind of in line to where you're going with that question. So let me jump to the next point here because I've got uh, several here that I wanted to to try to get to today. So mm -hmm. uh, the next point that I wanted to bring up, and this is again going back to deliberate practice. Deliberate deliberate practice takes a large amount of time. Mm -hmm. It it is acquired over a very long period of time, at least a decade. In fact, they call it the 10 year rule. So this really, uh, yeah. I, I find this really interesting because we are in a teaching practicum uh, in a, a program for teaching uh, teachers. So we're helping students uh, in a BA program you know, to become teachers. So I find this really interesting, this idea of the 10 year rule and that it kind of leads to this discussion. I'm sure you're, you, we've all heard of these, this idea that you need, you know, 10,000 hours, you need this right. to be an expert in anything, right? So whatever it is, if you're a musician, you have to put in the practice X amount of hours to, to be quote unquote, you know, proficient or uh, accomplished. So I, I'm curious about this idea of this, especially in our context, how, what do we do with this this idea of the 10 year rule? How do we bring that into our own context in some meaningful way for, for our students that we typically only have three to four years of, you know, I'm thinking practicum classes where they really don't get into the practicum maybe until the, maybe the last three, uh, three years of the program or whatever. What do we do with this idea? How does this relate to us? Well, they, in fact, uh, I think uh, I was reading in, in Mihaly's uh, idea. He, in fact, I think it's one of the conferences he, he gives when he mentions that it takes uh, it takes ten years for you to be uh, the, to have the minimal preparation to start creating, and everything everything before is just learning, acquiring, adapting. Um, uh, and, and, and everything before that period is your preparation. And once you spend this 10 year, uh, 10 year rule uh, into whatever you said you want to master, you may be ready to start creating something. And I think 
Uh, and I think you make a, you make a point there by saying that we have a BA that lasts for four years, five most uh, in, in case of students who go through the propedeutical year. And uh, um, but uh, we can I, I would make the comparison on the idea that they are on information, they are in preparation, and they have some very few experience, but they do go to the actual field while they're in those four or five years, <clears throat> and then they totally go full time. To, to the classrooms to start, uh, I would say, continuing their formation. And, uh, and uh, some of them may, may catch up fast to do things faster, maybe, but, uh, but I would agree that it takes long because uh, some of us have more than 10 years in this and still haven't created anything yet. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, I'm thinking, you know, this 10 year rule, I, I agree with the overall concept, the theory of it, but I also think it's kind of an arbitrary number because I think we can also uh, see examples of teachers that have many, many years of experience, but if they're mm -hmm. not reflective teachers, right? are they really improving? Do, I mean, do they have set up in their common practice uh, a way to actually turn their experience into learning uh, opportunities because you know it's it's easy to see I think if we get caught in a rut and we're doing the same thing every day I mean we can imagine a, a case where you know we're actually not really learning much at all we're just going through the motions every year to year and gaining quote-unquote experience but maybe not necessarily gaining knowledge and understandings and, and further skills so I think <clears throat> that when I thought about this 10-year rule and I thought about our program, and I thought, and just in general, English, your own personal development, professional development, it's really the skills that you set up to become a, a reflective practitioner. What do you do to, to turn a, an experience into a learning experience? What do you do to even recognize that ex an experience is a, learn, uh, is, a, is a learning experience, that a, some, some classroom experience is something that you can learn from? And so I think... I, the best that any pro project or um, program can do is to find the way to help students, again, become reflective practitioners, basically the topic of today's discussion, so that they, they have those strategies with them to continue beyond the, the program when they get in, uh, into the field and they're working, they're becoming professionals, that they take on those, uh, those strategies and continue those behaviors so that they continue to learn. Yeah, I, I saw when you mentioned about this topic, I saw a short video, very, very short video by Anders Ericsson about delivered practice, but he's focusing a little bit more on the automatic skills somehow. <clears throat> and, um, and he actually mentions about this, uh, not as years, but at the thousand times, I don't know how many times, uh, 100,000 times you have to do something to master it. And he even gives as example uh, creating cigars, right? And, and how people, and they have studies about people playing a violin or playing tennis or creating cigars in which uh, they do it and they take certain amount of time, seconds to create, to make one. And then the, after doing it, the, the 100,000 times, they diminish the time to a third or things like those, right? But yes, it goes totally with your idea that we're talking about um, not only doing something automatically, we're talking about reflecting about it. And it brought to my mind something I discussed with, uh, with Dr. Um, uh, Cecilia Delgado, the psychologist, that we were talking about reflection and she, she was saying that naturally uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a study that mentions certain ages for the development of deep, re deep reflection and it's after uh, teenhood, right? And, uh, we put a number like around the twenty uh, after twenty years or something like that, and I was mentioning like, uh, so uh, am, am I doing wrong in demanding from my students, which are under that age, like around 17, 18 years old, demanding for them to reflect up to certain uh, uh, degree of of um, of critical uh, reflection in that sense? And she was saying that well, it's just a number, as you mentioned, it's kind of a Kind of not really arbitrary, but it's kind of just a number because uh, when you enhance reflection at any age, people start reflecting. So there is not really, 
there is no uh, in, indeed there is not an age i mean this is just another study which may consider certain different factors or or maybe just to have a, a, a mean about the situation in mexico maybe i don't know but at the end she was saying like uh, it's good that you start enhancing this kind of reflecting in younger people maybe even younger than 17 that 15 so they can uh, develop this capacity of reflection under those principles making a combination what well, yes i go again with you and the idea of the 10 years may be just a number again just to have a uh let's say a, a goal a, 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 an end line well not an end line but a, a landmark to reach maybe somehow but yes it depends on what you do how often you do it and how reflective you become because afterwards this guy ericsson even though he's mentioning a lot about uh, automatic uh, things somehow and sports and things like those uh, totally ends up with the idea of uh, reflecting on it, reflecting and he mentions the planning reflecting and um and evaluating uh, in fact somehow uh, he mentioned three three kind of aspects which goes around this three i don't remember exactly which ones but totally reflection was in the center I'm reminded, I'm reminded of a, I'm reminded of a story of uh, Yo-Yo Ma, the celloist, the famous celloist that plays classical music. And I remember a story where he was, he shared that the way that he learned, because somebody asked him, "How do you memorize all of these pieces? You know, the, these cello, these uh, classical pieces that go on for many minutes, and he's memorized all of these pieces." And he says, "Well, when I was young." I would take five measures. I would I would learn five measures. He learned five measures mm -hmm. at a time. He would learn the first five measures, then he would learn the second five me measures, and then those ten measures, and so on. And that's how he continued to learn into as an adult, gaining more uh, experience. That's right. how he learned uh, to 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 memorize all of those. So I, I think of in our case with uh, <laughs> teachers. If we can give them the certain strategies and, and the actual behaviors of trying to, to reflect and learn from their experiences, that the idea is that they take away take those away with them as they gain more experience, they, they get into the field and they take those and, and hopefully learn more strategies as they, they go on. But um, you know, trying to find or help students find their own way and find the strategies that work best for them for, for reflective practice. But um, I thought it was interesting, this 10-year rule, um, and I think there's some, you know, I think it's important to mention it, um, but I think that that the, one of the main points for me anyway is this idea of, you know, what, what kind of strategies really are part of that, those 10 years, right? Is, uh, what are they actually doing in those 10 years, I think means a little bit more than, than the actual number of years that they assign to this particular and, and maybe the point for stating the rule is exactly that to make you aware of uh, what we're discussing right now make you aware that it's not really the 10 years is the the from the uh different uh processes you you make through in order to get to it right and the different thoughts it comes to you and the different ways you reflect about it and um <clears throat> and and how much how much time you take, how, how much you invest, right? Not because of the time, because of the investment. As, as long as people don't walk away thinking, okay, I've, I've been do doing this for 10 years, now I know what I'm doing, without any other consideration, <laughs> right, of, uh, of right. what actually, what they did within those 10 years. Okay, I want to jump to the next point here, because I think this is a really interesting point. Uh, this is from John Carroll. And this is going back to 1963, so this is nothing new. Again, this is just a, a summary of different reflections, uh, different ways of looking at teacher reflection. But I think this is still relevant today, and I, I find it interesting. He breaks it down. He thinks that uh, he considers reflective practice an interplay between three things. The first is aptitude. Aptitude mm -hmm. he defines as how long it takes a person to learn something. The okay. second is perseverance. Perseverance is how long a person is willing to spend on the subject. And three, opportunity. Opportunity is how much time a person is allowed to learn something. So looking at this idea of aptitude, how long it takes a person to learn something, perseverance, how long a person is willing to spend on the, uh, the subject, and opportunity 
how much time a person actually has, mm -hmm. I think is really important. I think sometimes we take maybe two out of these three. We don't consider the other third uh, aspect. But I think I, I like this approach because it really looks at these three aspects and how they come together. And again, as he mentions, the interplay of these these three points. And again, in teacher practicum and, and as we are in a program for helping teachers become uh, practitioners, how can we incorporate these three in some sort of a reflective fashion so that, you know, that they're more aware that this idea of this metacognitive awareness uh, is is allowed to happen for the learner and uh, teacher um well let me tell you a little bit what i uh what i do what i do and i want to be very careful about this because i have a couple of students right now watching <laughs> on facebook and um uh and and i want to be like kind of uh, go step by step in here mm. people is the every, every individual has uh, their own characteristics they're different, they have uh, different, they come with natural skills, uh, uh, preform attitudes, and, um, and, and some knowledge at different levels. And, uh, and therefore, the development in teaching is at different paces. So in pre-service teachers, you need to be, my, my opinion is that you need to be very, um, observe uh, observative i don't know if that's if that's correct um uh you need to to be very careful to know your students and to be analytic on what they do uh since the very beginning what they can do what they are willing to do uh and how much they are investing which i go with these terms uh, i think with this idea of the aptitude the perseverance and the opportunity you mentioned there uh, and start demanding from them according to their individuality which is kind of difficult and it's uh, and it's very and you need to be very careful when you work in a place where standards are the aim and everybody's measured by the same by 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 the same in amount of inches and you have to you have to know your students first. I, I would go for that. Know your students first and establish a relationship. Establish a connection. And these are topics we have discussed before. Establish a connection with the students in a way that you can actually demand from them at their own level. I've had students before which come to, to the, their first simulation, simulated practice with great skills. And, and they do very good things, they are very creative, they can handle groups, they master the language, and it looks like they're, they are just uh, in the flow <laughs> again. Um, and those students still, you need to look for which is the height of the bar that you're going to set for those students and how you're going to make them aware of it. Uh, not creating a conflict with the other students at the same time, which may be really at their first, uh, well, everybody's at their first simulated practice, but, that, but which may not be at the same capacities in that sense. Uh, I, go, I go with this idea of um, uh, identifying the aptitudes they have and then work with the perseverance they, they put on it and the opportunities they have. I think that's the way I cope with it a little bit more because uh, I tend to ask them and demand from them according to their level. And, and for some students, I even uh, ask them to risk things. Sometimes I tell them, you are at this stage, so you need to risk it and go for these kind of activities. Or for example, this semester, I gave a couple of students the opportunity to uh, go and help another classmate from seventh semester, a higher semester, to, um, to, to substitute her during a week in their actual practice, which is, uh, I mean, it's going to be a big jump from simulated practices to having an actual group and, and being in there. And, uh, but we are doing these kind of things according to students themselves, right? And I think that's pretty much one thing. Uh, you need to be very analytic and, and, and more than yourself. 
you need to, to, to understand how to help the students be aware of their attitudes, the investment they are doing, the perseverance they are having in there, and uh, how to adapt and adjust the times and the opportunities they have precisely for developing. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, for me, the key, I, I look at this from two perspectives. One perspective is the teacher trainer, the the te the 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 teacher who is in our program, for example, who is studying, taking courses, and versus those in-service teachers who are in the field. So if we take first those in serve or pre-service teachers or the teachers in training, the opportunity, of course, is going to be mainly the semester, right? That's pretty much the time frame. And the time frame within a semester, maybe there are divisions of time where they have only a certain amount of time to achieve uh, a certain, you know, a, a certain level of skill or, or knowledge. But I'm curious about the aptitude here is you, you mentioned awareness. And for me, I think help uh, us helping students or student teachers to become more aware of what they're learning, what they need to learn, Mm -hmm. For them to understand the gap between where they are now and where they need to be, I think is important. And perseverance, how we as uh, the teachers to help facilitate this learning process, how can we uh, find out how much they're willing to spend on the subject? How much time, what right. kind of what kind of you know strategies are they using? what kind how are they dedicating their time to this learning uh, of this particular thing? And, 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 and let me really trying there. to make those those connections between the perseverance and the aptitude. The opportunity for us is fixed, right? That's, I mean, and there's some flexibility maybe within the semester, but you know, th there's not much a, a room for you know adjustment and formal education just by design, right? But right. I think the perseverance and the aptitude and bringing about the awareness of the aptitude and then the reflection and how they articulate or communicate their willingness to spend certain amount of time on a, on a subject, I think is, is really important that they can kind of match those, those two aspects, aptitude and perseverance. And let me tell you, uh, I want to say that I'm really lucky in there because uh, the subjects I work on is the actual practicum. So uh, most of the students are actually willing to spend time in that, situ in, in, in those, in that situation because it's what they're going to do for the rest of their lives. When you, when you come to meet somebody that is not really willing to take the time, it's more likely somebody who's going to drop off sooner or later or is not going to really uh, teach afterwards or dedicate life for teaching. But most of them are willing to do it. And, uh, but I wonder how you do it, for example, in your subjects, which are not really the actual practicum, which are like uh, necessary, highly necessary um, abilities and skills and knowledge they have to develop in order to be uh, uh, professionals indeed in, in teaching, but uh, at the moment of uh, going through the BA, maybe it's a higher number of students that they don't see it as, uh, as, as beneficial as being, for example, in a class teaching and teaching. Yeah, I, because, yeah, I mean, I think that we can look at it from different types of classes, and I guess each type of class is going to be different. You know, in my case, like you said, I'm, I'm more skill-based, uh, like so my courses are typically more uh, directed towards helping learners become better English, uh, English speakers and, and communicators. Um, but, yeah, I think it's just a combination of the way, for me personally, how I – try to find different ways to evaluate or assess my students through both formative and summative assessment, the ways that I give feedback, the ways that I flip the classroom to give them different opportunities of, of interacting with the content. And I think a lot of this awareness for the, I'm thinking of the aptitude, how long it takes a person to learn something. I want that to be evident. I want it to be so implied that I don't even necessarily have to articulate it explicitly, right? Just through the, the way that I'm giving feedback. So if I tell them very simply, remember, you know, you could have done it this way, this way, this way. And we'd already talked about it this way and this way. And we'd been talking about it for three weeks, right? They're in some way they're saying, okay, I still d didn't get it. Okay. And then hopefully re related to their perseverance, how long they're willing to spend on the subject, they're looking and saying, okay, what I've been doing in the past isn't working. So mm -hmm. I need to be changing something and doing something differently when he says do this and maybe I need to try that. And, and so I think indirectly through the way that I have 
design my assessment and that it's still ongoing and it, and it, 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 it adapts depending on the student. But I think that this awareness of the aptitude and perseverance, I think, is indirectly, it relates to, to the way that I assess. And for everybody, I mean, for all teachers, I think that this is uh, what we're maybe not, and I like, and this is why I like this particular idea here, because I've never really thought it explicitly in terms of aptitude, perseverance, and opportunity. But now that it mentioned that, you know, I read and come across this idea, again, this idea come, is, is not new but that I think it helps me anyway to look at how I look at my assessment and how I can try to facilitate the awareness of those, those, three, uh, those three aspects. W the last point I wanna make about this, and this is really the big question for me, is how does this look? Because for me, there's a big difference between teacher trainers and looking at these, the interplay between these three and the in-service teacher. Like, okay, so you look at us, for example, teachers who are in the field, other teachers who are in the field, what does this aptitude, perseverance, and opportunity look like now? Uh, the opportunity, now you've got how much time uh, is there, right, to learn something? Well, that, could, that needs to be now determined by the individual himself or herself, usually, unless the school mandates some sort of learning you know, uh, objective that says, okay, you need to learn this by, by this date, which is certainly the case. It could be the case, but if there's no mandate coming from a school or institution, then each teacher needs to bring it upon himself or herself to say, okay, I'm going to set certain goals and I need to try to learn this thing in within this given uh, time frame. And we can also look at the aptitude and the perseverance, how much you're willing to Oh, let, let, let me give you an example, a fresh example. Yesterday I talked to a teacher about this precisely. There is a course, there's a course, uh, a federal course about the new national um, educational model. Uh, she mentioned they had like more than 100 people in the, in the presentation stage, like in the induction part of the, of the course, right? more than a hundred people and then during this presentation induction they're like the intro to the course they mention it's not going to be taken into account for any kind of credits they're not going to give any kind of recon and they have to do certain uh, amount of things uh it's kind of uh, autonomous learning but at the same time they have deadlines uh, to to fulfill and they do have supervisors so it's not that autonomous uh in fact, it's a little bit more controlled than previous courses as they have had in which they, in which they do have recons. And more than 100 uh, teachers being there drop down to less than 25. Less than 25 teachers taking that course, which it's something I think, now I'm not thinking about 100, I'm thinking about thousands of, of teachers actually going through the uh, na national model of education for whatever reason uh, and not thinking about politics or other things thinking about that it's actually the program that it's there right so I think that makes a point about what you're saying right yeah and <laughs> I think it also makes a point I'm just looking at the community here the teacher learning cast community like those who are following on Facebook, those who follow the broadcast live on YouTube, those who go into the Facebook page and leave comments throughout the week, all of that relates to perseverance. Now, whether it's within our community, I'm just using this as an example, or some other community, but the what does it take to get a teacher to communicate, to interact with someone else outside of their own school setting that's, you know, without... Uh, forget about the teachers you see every day where you're actually quote unquote forced to see, right? Because I mean, you're, you, it's a job, you go there. So you're, uh, you're there, uh, by, by obligation, right. To a degree. Um, but you know, what does it take to actually reach out and, and find another community online through technology to interact with someone for the first time that you've never met, but that you have some sort of common interest. Yeah. What are you willing to do? to do that and and you know how long is it gonna are you willing to to do that in order to you know 
increase your skills, your, your, you know, and, and bring it into your own, your own practice, your own reality, your own context. Um, I think this is a huge question, but I think it's at the root of all of our own decisions that we make when we look at our own personal develop and professional development is we're making decisions, whether we are articulating them or not, whether it's implicit or not, or explicit we're looking at aptitude, perseverance, and opportunity really in terms of, okay, what am I getting out of this? And, you know, how does this help me? Right. Because presumably you're not going to, you're not going to be engaged in a community like this unless you feel that you're getting something out of it. Right. Otherwise you just, you know, you feel like you're wasting your time. So, so that's the thing. I think that when we look at being reflective practitioners, as much as we can make these three explicit, I think the better. I think it, when we look at what is reflective teaching, I think it's making explicit mm -hmm. what our aptitudes are, being honest about ourselves, right? And, and, and really identifying our own strengths and weaknesses, our perseverance, looking at actually what the time that we're dedicating, like for, for us, we said, okay, every Saturday morning, we're going to do this. Uh, we're in, and we're going to dedicate this time. How much time is, is it, are we going to allow for the opportunity to, to actually learn something? Okay, we set individual goals and we communicate those uh, in, some, in some way. And so that's, I think, you know, the, the main points for me uh, looking at, again, this is John Carroll. This is a, an idea that is not new. Um, but I think it's worth bringing up again because I think it's still very much relevant in some of the decisions we make, especially when we look at teacher professional development, our own teacher professional development, uh, as well as those that uh, of our colleagues, uh, whether we're in teaching programs or not, even if we're just interacting with another teacher, just being aware of their aptitudes, their perseverance and their opportunities, I think also helps us see how we all kind of work together or perhaps don't work together in those cases where these this interplay doesn't really gel or come together. Well, it's all about uh it's all about attitudes and behaviors, right? In, indeed, attitudes and behavior, that means character. It's about character. Jaime Escalante mentioned, uh, I don't know if you, heard, if you saw the movie Stand and Deliver, very famous movie for teachers. And Jaime Escalante mentioned, what does it take to do it? Ganas, the will to do it. So, uh, that's what it takes. I would put it in a word like passion. I'm looking at it from the point of view. I mean, I, I, I live in, in different social circles and professional circles, and, 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 it, and I see the same thing in all of them. For some of the professionals there, uh, it's life. It's totally life. For some teachers, teaching is totally life. For some musicians, music is life. For some uh, doctors, uh, health and, 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 uh, and uh, healthcare, it's life. For dentists, uh, uh, all the hygiene and everything that they have to do to care about the, the dental uh, health, it's life. And, and for some others, it's not. Uh, so I think it's a matter of passion and getting, uh, uh, the, you know, there's a saying that uh, when you do what you like, you are not really working. You are having like, a, you're enjoying your hobby and they're paying you for doing it, right? And, um, and I like that idea in that sense. And I think it, it's, uh, you, you don't have to take it like this is your life. You can take it like this is part of your life and enjoy it as an integral, as part of your integral part of life in order to, to, to make it part of your character, to transform these attitudes and those behaviors, which, which totally uh, uh, like uh, cope with the, idea of the aptitude, the perseverance, and the opportunity. And, and I, I also go with the idea of the challenge and the skills you have uh, when we talked about the flow. Remember, we talked about not only the skills, but the, uh, everything else that goes around as a, as a human being, as an integral human being. And, and, it, and it, go in, it all starts um, in the, yourself, in the attitude you put towards it, and, 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 uh, and make the best of it and maybe if you find out it's not your thing, uh, at least you know, right? Because if you never put it into, if you never put this willingness, this passion into what you are doing, you will never know if it's really yours or not. You will only go navigating a little bit through here, a little bit through there, 
but uh, when you actually uh, dedicate some time, uh, when you actually go through this deliberate practice and you try to keep on flowing and changing this path, uh, uh, path towards, I think all of this reflecting, it's exactly what gives you a little bit, the opportunity to realize if it, it's your thing or not. And you may face with the, the, the bitter truth that it's not your thing. Okay, so go and try another thing, right? But but at least try it because just uh, having a glance at it, it may not be enough for you to know. Yeah, when you said ganas, right? You have to have, you, have, you need ganas. You need yeah. the will, the drive to do it. The first thing that I thought about, I thought about my own case, you know, and I thought about well, what drives me to write a blog? What drives me to do teacher learning cast every week? What drives me to share a lot of what I do face to face with my students publicly online? What drives me? And and I can say, okay, well, maybe I have Ghana's right. Maybe I don't know. May, I just have the will. But where does that come from? For me personally, when I interact with someone, and I think we're all to a degree like this. If if we, for example, have you and I are having a conversation. Mm -hmm. If nobody attends, nobody shows up, nobody watches, nobody leaves feedback, it's just you and me discussing things I've, uh, regarding education, things we've, we've been talking about. I leave the uh, conversation like, okay, I, I feel like I've learned something. Now, either it's something that mm -hmm. I've already, I, maybe I already knew and I feel stronger about it, mm -hmm. or maybe there's something else that a new perspective was brought up that I should consider later on, whatever it is. But I feel like there was some, there was some value in having that conversation. When I post something to my pod, my, uh, my blog, I feel like just the act of sharing that information is a learning experience. So, um, for, for me, I think that's at the root of all teacher development is each teacher finding that space whether it's online, face-to-face, -face, whatever it happens to be, wherever it happens to be, if it's in Facebook or Twitter, wherever, but finding those spaces where that kind of communication can happen and thinking selflessly or selfishly that you are benefiting. Like I can say having this discussion here, I'm being selfish because I feel like I'm getting a lot out of this. I'm learning something, right? And even if nobody else watches, uh, I feel like I get something out of it. But the more people that, that interact, more perspectives are being shared, then it, it, it scales. It actually can grow that knowledge base by having other opinions brought into the conversation. So I think that it's really finding what drives people, what drives you Right to motivate you to to interact and converse with others in topics that that you feel strongly about. And I guess the the main assumption here is that if you're a teacher and you enjoy teaching, you enjoy learning. That's really the assumption, right? If if you're in a position where you're teaching but you don't like to learn, mm -hmm. then this conversation really is not really for you, right? So um, I think one of the assumption is that we're re you know, the teachers that we're addressing here are those who really like to learn new things and, and talk about topics that they feel passionate about with regard to their teaching practice. Yes, uh, and um, on, on my end, I can tell you that uh, I, I, my perspective right now, my, my, my field, is that uh, the world itself, as big as it sounds, it's looking for uh, individualism, for people to... Uh, be on their own to develop human beings who can deal with life by their own on their own with no attachments with nothing else and that's my perception and, and, and I don't want to get into any argument about this but but to make the point that uh, I go on the other way on the on the intra personal relationship which which is totally needed which is uh, we are social human beings we uh, we need from each other exactly precisely. I I I think there are um, there are still communities, native communities, in which uh, father is every member of the community for uh, for the kids because everybody else in the community raised them uh, as if they were fathers. Uh, maybe this is like uh, the other uh, the extreme end right of the comment, but. Pretty much that's the idea, this sharing, this interconnection with other people, this talking, 
this uh this talking it out loud and, and, and i mean to begin with it's not the same to put it in your mind that to put it out in loud words that actually make sense that's the beginning beyond whatever capacity you have and i would go for the idea that um if you uh, whatever your capacity is whichever uh expertise you have or how good you are at something if you put it out, out loud and then you can see the reflection of your words in the other person or the other group of persons and then you get feedback maybe not spoken feedback just by their, their there's an article about a teacher that says i just look at their eyes just look at their eyes and that's the beginning too i mean uh putting it out loud in words looking at people's uh reactions and then listening to other people talking about the same idea i think this is what it is about right what it's about when we are talking about learning and you can go beyond and that's why i put the example of this i don't remember the name of the communities in which they all raise the kids as if all they were fighters they they go beyond words and learning and knowledge they they go live they go they they live live in that way right and yeah, I think one of the things important that you mentioned for me is uh, really reflecting at different levels. And that happens to be one of the, the, the models that they also talk about in the book is that, you know, you can reflect individually in pairs and groups within the schools. And they don't talk about this in the book, but you can expand that obviously between schools. So, you know, taking the reflective practice at, at those different levels, um, even a, w beyond the school and within schools, um, I think really is if you can achieve that uh, within a school as a school, I think you're taking reflection to a new level. I mean, it's, it really goes yeah. beyond just a, a one to one or even a group reflective practice that it really takes it to a new level. Just uh, uh, much of what you're, you're saying, Pity. Uh, but I think we're, we're almost out of time here. We're at, at about an hour. We like to keep these to an hour, but, uh, this discussion that was really, uh, helpful for me, PD. I enjoy this discussion. I think this is something that that we needed to talk about to provide some different perspectives on, on reflective practice. I think something that we'll be talking about a lot going forward, because it's a topic that I think we both feel strongly about. But uh, I want to thank everyone for watching this uh, broadcast and reach out and ask if you want to be a part of this broadcast. Check out our page in Facebook, Teacher Learning Cast. Leave us comments share your experiences. How do you reflect? How do you reflect in your own teaching practice? If you're teaching now, whether or if you're a pre-service teacher, how are you reflecting? What are some ways that you could reflect that you perhaps aren't doing currently that would, would allow you to uh, further your own professional development? Let us know what your thoughts are. Post them in Facebook. Um, post it in, uh, in YouTube as a comment below this video. And uh, we'll we'll reach we'll find them and uh, we'll, we will reply. We like to always reply to uh, the comments as you post them. So, uh, Pity, thanks a lot for for this this talk this week. Right, thank you, Ben. I want to thank everybody that is joining through Facebook Live. Chio Rahel, who, uh, who is joining us every week, almost. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, Ricardo Vasquez is, is also joining us every week. Thank you for watching. Angelica, Rudy Hernandez, Fernando Aguila. Leticia Padilla, Mariana Ramirez, my student from first semester, they, they are in, they're right now in the stage of observation. And uh, Alma Zaragoza, uh, Randy also connected himself. And thank you very much for coming and going. We have uh, already 23 programs with this one. You can go back and watch any topic you're interested uh, on. And you can ask us to retake and recover some of the aspect or expand because many times we just cover very superficially uh, some topics. This reflection topic, uh, that's why I, I didn't want to get that much into it because we've been talking about this for two weeks and we can go, well, three weeks maybe, and we can go on and on and on and on about this. And, and, and I think it's good that we, that we do. So uh, if you want to listen to something specific, if you have a question, let us know. Uh, not because we know it all, but because we can Google it and we can discuss about it. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, thank you everyone for watching and uh, we'll see everyone next week in the next broadcast next Saturday. Thanks everybody. Keep on learning.